With less than three weeks now until midterm elections, a familiar political face is working to help energize Republicans. The Atlantic article entitled The Man Who Broke Politics examines the lasting impact of former Speaker of the House and President Trump's ally, Newt Gingrich. He continues to have an influence on today's politics, and this article credits Gingrich for laying the groundwork for President Trump's rise. It says he pioneered, quote, a style of partisan combat that poisoned America's political culture and plunged Washington into total dysfunction. McKay Coppins is a staff writer for The Atlantic, penned that article, joins us now. Subtle you are not. Uh, so, so tell us <laughs> about how it all began for Newt Gingrich. He, he started his political career during a, a grim time for the Republican Party, right out of the Watergate scandal and its fallout. Yeah. What were his views then about what to do with the GOP and how was it received initially? So what he says is that when he entered Congress, uh, it was just in the wake of Watergate, you know, scores of Republican lawmakers had kind of been wiped out. And uh, what he sensed was that Republicans in Congress were settling into a permanent minority mindset, meaning that they were co content to kind of never take back Congress and to just sort of work with the Democrats and, and continue to go along to get along. And Newt Gingrich, from the very beginning, had this very candid strategy, which was to engineer a take a, a, a takeover of Congress by the Republican Party by sort of paralyzing uh, the bipartisan coalitions that had up to that point been really crucial to legislation, and then to turn around and, and tell the American people, look, Congress isn't working, you need to give power to the Republicans. And he, it took him about 20 years uh, to, to kind of finally pull it off, but he was very methodical, very strategic about it. Uh, he would pick fights from the, from the House floor, he used the media, and frankly, a very kind of Trumpian way to drive his narratives. He did not bother with kind of in existing institutions and, and party committees. Uh, he kind of just went and did it himself, and, uh, and frankly, it worked. Explain how a lot of what he laid the groundwork for in the 90s is familiar to us today. I mean, Time Magazine named him Man of the Year in the early 90s. Uh, he was Speaker of the House during the Clinton administration. What was it he did at that time where he created or at least cemented a partisan divide that has really uh, persevered? Well, this is the thing. By the time that he engineered kind of the Republican Revolution in 1994 and became Speaker of the House, he had played a pretty instrumental role in kind of poisoning the political culture in Washington. Uh, for a long time, there had been this kind of uh, commitment to comedy and uh, and decorum and tradition. And by the time he became Speaker, that a lot of that was had been kind of shredded. Uh, and a lot of this is embodied in the battles that he had with the Clinton White House over the federal budget. He was one of the early pioneers years of the weaponized government shutdown, for example, where, uh, in, you know, instead of just kind of coming to the table and negotiating in good faith over uh, policy and ideological differences with President Clinton, he, uh, he forced a government shutdown and kind of held hundreds of thousands of, uh, of paychecks and the federal government hostage uh, until he could get what he wanted. Now, that strategy didn't work for him in the 90s, but from that point on, it, it kind of ensured that the looming uh, government shutdown down would exist as, as a possibility in every congressional standoff. That's just one of many ways that his kind of strategic obstructionism and partisan combat uh, have continued to have an, inf an, an effect in today's politics. Now, some might look at that and say, hey, that's rough and tumble politics. President Trump says Washington is a terrible place. People are so mean and vicious. <laughs> and you keep, you know, coming back to this term or using this phrase of, you know, what he was doing was poisoning the process. Specifically, what was it about his strategy? strategy that was so different? Was it the personalization of politics? Was it the, you know, your opponent is your absolute enemy you must uh, destroy rather than <clears throat> kind of the, the Senator John McCain philosophy, which is, look, we may disagree on policy, but personally, we can get along. What was it that, that was so that, damaging that, about that what was it. did? Right. The, the thing that he did that was that was, I think you could argue damaging, but also quite effective from a, you know, just cynical standpoint was reframing the policy battles in Washington in, in this kind of grand sweeping warlike narrative uh, where mm. it, it's not just Republicans versus Democrats or conservatives versus liberals. It's good versus evil. Right. White hats versus black hats. Uh, and, and he really excelled at finding, uh, you know, stories in popular culture or 
uh, you know, current events or, or whatever and turning them into political issues. It's hard to overstate how kind of radical a lot of this was at the time uh, because we kind of accept it now as just this is, like you said, rough and tumble politics. Uh, but at the time, it really was new. Uh, he, he in, in fact, very early on when he was running for Congress the first time, he gave this speech to a group of college Republicans where he told them, you know, the biggest problem we have in the Republican Party today is that we don't encourage you to be nasty. Those are his words. And he said, yeah. we need to understand that politics is above all a war for power. And that's kind of how he has approached politics every day since then. But speaking of his aim for power, you know, his name was floated on a number of shortlists for roles within the Trump administration, including including VP, we understand. Did he choose not to yeah. take any of these roles, or was it President Trump who decided not to bring him in? How, how did that turn out? So based on my reporting, uh, he did want the vice presidency, and he almost got it. Uh, you know, Trump very seriously considered him, ended up not picking him for a, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but it, it was kind of commonly understood that in the wake of Trump's election that Newt Gingrich would have, uh, you know, his pick of jobs because he had been a loyal and outspoken ally uh, of the president-elect. Um, as it turned out, according to a transition official I spoke to, Newt Gingrich kind of decided right away that he was making too much money in the private sector uh, to, to be bothered to take one of the lower kind of cabinet positions or a White House position. Uh, and so he asked to just, he had two requests of the transition team. One was that his name be leaked as a uh, somebody who was being considered for high office, which did happen, uh, and then also that his wife, Callista, be named the ambassador to the Vatican. She was a lifelong Catholic. This was kind of a dream job for her, and that happened as well. So Newt Gingrich did not get an official position in the administration, but he told me he talks to the White House 10 to 15 times a week and remains kind of very engaged in Republican partisan politics uh, right now. He may have received more of his uh, wishes outside of the White House uh, than inside. Uh, McKay Coppins <laughs> with The Atlantic. Here's Correct. the article, uh, The Man Who Broke Politics. Be sure to check it out. Great to speak with you. Thank you.